Subaru might make the best-selling small crossover in America, but this new Corolla Cross Hybrid certainly gives it a run for its money, and I think this is the best small crossover available in the U.S. right now. This has the combination of all-wheel drive, 196 horsepower, significantly more power than average for this segment, and a whopping 42 miles per gallon. This is the most fuel-efficient entry in the segment, and now among the most powerful as well. But before we get to that class-leading hybrid system, let's talk about the look of the Corolla Cross Hybrid, because you'll notice this is different than the non-hybrid Corolla Cross. That certainly looks like a miniaturized version of the Highlander. It has a pretty elegant front end, and this front end looks a little bit more like the regular Corolla. That's because the Corolla Cross Hybrid is only gonna come in S, SE, and XSE trims, basically the sportier line in the Corolla lineup. So we get a reworked front end, Definitely a bit more of an aggressive front end. Lots of black going on here. Shiny black above, dull black below. Toyota logo right there in the middle and this sort of little grill looking thing. That's not actually a grill, however. We have full LED headlights over here and LED fog lights below. When Subaru created the Crosstrek, they simply took an Impreza hatchback, lifted it up and added some extra body cladding. But that's not what Toyota chose to do with the Corolla Cross. This is quite a different vehicle. And again, it's a blend of Highlander, maybe a little bit of RAV4 style-wise, and then mechanically some Corolla and actually a little bit of Prius as well. This styling right back here is definitely very Highlander with the haunch that starts right here around the rear doors, continues right there, wraps around with the taillights. And then this section up here definitely gives me a lot of mini RAV4 vibes. It's definitely a solid, attractive look. Look, I like the two-tone color scheme that we find in this XSE trim. Let me know what you think about that down there. The chrome strip that runs front to rear really punctuates this two-tone color scheme, and I like that they didn't wrap it completely around the window. This gives it a bit more of a modern vibe. Now, in terms of length, this is almost exactly the same size as the Subaru Crosstrek, but you'll notice that the profile is quite different. The roof is definitely higher. That means that loading things onto the roof is going to be a bit trickier than the Crosstrek, but it also means that the interior is shaped more like you might assume a small SUV should be. We have a relatively long hood profile up front, but we have about the same kind of ground clearance that we find in the Crosstrek. It's only about half an inch lower in this hybrid model. Dimensionally, this is a little bit longer than the non-hybrid model, but all those changes seem to be right up here in the front bumper. This is about 10 inches longer than the Kona, about five inches shorter than a RAV4. So this is certainly on the large side of the segment. The two-tone color scheme continues out back where we find a black spoiler on top. Rear windshield wiper lovers rejoice. There's a wiper back there. We get full LED taillight modules, but the turn signals are red, not amber. I do think that's a bit of a misstep there. Black on black for the rear bumper here and a power hatch. Under the hood is where the magic happens. The engineers essentially lifted the same e-all-wheel drive hybrid system from the Prius, put it right here under this hood. The engine produces 150 horsepower, 139 pound-feet of torque, and when combined with the three electric motor generator units, two on that side of the engine bay and one in the back of the vehicle, you get 196 horsepower total and 45 miles per gallon in the city, 38 on the highway, 42 miles per gallon combined. This system uses a lithium ion battery pack rather than a nickel metal pack like we find in some other hybrids. So if you're worried about that, fear not. But it also uses the e-all wheel drive system from the Prius. So it's not going to be able to send as much power to the rear axle as the regular Corolla Cross. If you're worried about all wheel drive performance, you might want to go non-hybrid. But if you're looking for all wheel drive with 42 miles per gallon, this is the only option in town. And of course, if you want more than 196 horsepower, you're basically looking at a Dodge Hornet. Definitely very different than this. Front seat comfort is substantially similar to the rest of the Corolla lineup because the front seats are pretty similar in terms of their design. We have a multi-way power driver's seat with two-way adjustable lumbar support, but the front passenger seat, even in this top end trim, is still a manual only design. Versus something like the Crosstrek, the seating position is certainly more upright. These seats are higher off the floorboards, and because this has a taller, boxier profile, I can certainly put the seat in a much more upright position if I really wanted to. So if you're looking for something that drives more like an SUV, you might want to take a look at this. If you want something that feels more like a car behind the wheel, you might want to take a look at that Crosstrek. The rear seats are also surprisingly roomy, even though this only has 76 inches of combined legroom. I think that's because you can sit in that more upright position up front, giving me maybe about four or five inches of legroom. If, however, you wanted to sit in a more relaxed, reclined position, that's really gonna drop down sort of like this seat right over here, which is almost all the way back in its tracks. I have maybe about half an inch of legroom. This is still a relatively small vehicle. And if you want a little bit more room for things like rear-facing child seats, 
you might want to take a look at some of the other options. However, back here, we do have air vents, which we do not find in the new Crosstrek. I think that is a really nice touch. And gobs and gobs of headroom. Sitting here, I have maybe about three inches of headroom left. Again, even though this has the optional moonroof. The amount of headroom back here is really surprising. If you're a family of taller people and you're looking for something smaller, this is definitely the way to go. We're gonna get a little bit less legroom, but the compensation is an absolutely massive amount of headroom. Here's another look at that rear seat headroom. There's Brian at 5'9 back there, and as you can see, he has plenty of headroom. As you'd expect, the rear seats fold flat, but they're a little bit higher off the ground than the cargo area. Now, when it comes to the cargo area, those taller folks should be aware that heads do touch the hatch when it is open, so you might need to duck down a little bit. Back here, we find a pretty large and square cargo area, roller-style cargo cover, but the cargo volume does drop down from the regular non-hybrid model because of what's going on under the floor, from 23.8 cubic feet down to 20.3. That is still, however, a little bit better than Crosstrek and definitely a little bit better than Nero as well. Starting all the way down the rabbit hole, you'll notice that we don't have a spare. That's very different than the RAV4 hybrid, which does have a spare and even enough room for a full-size spare in the hybrid trim. Instead, we get this high-voltage disconnect for the rear electric motor. Toyota could very easily have located that, I don't know, over here somewhere to at least maintain the ability to add one in your self-aftermarket. As it is here, you might be able to do it, but it would require an awful lot of fiddling back here. Then there's another thing weird going on. Over that, we find a big foam divider, but it is really big and thick. That's how I know a spare tire would fit in there because this is basically spare tire sized, but not a lot of storage going on. They definitely could have created a much better storage organizer there. And then there's a lot of room left around here with these big plastic dividers where you can't put any cargo either. Then on top of all of that goes this little load floor right there. Being the kind of person that I am, I'm not too bothered by this because I could definitely get creative and reclaim a lot of that storage area. I could probably even squeeze a temporary spare tire down there without too much effort. But I think it was a little bit lazy of Toyota to not do that from the factory. Now on the other hand, again, 42 miles per gallon, all wheel drive hybrid, it's the only one and everything else in this segment is gonna have some sort of compromise or another. I think this is probably the best compromise that we could have hoped for. On the inside, the majority of the interior is styled like the Corolla, but not every part is directly shared with the Corolla. Keep in mind, this is the XSE trim, so there are going to be things in here you won't find in the base model. Also, that warning over there on the sun visor says that this is a pre-production trim, so things might not be quite right either. We have a pretty typically sized sunroof just over the driver and front passenger seats. That is not standard. Height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and the front passenger. The headrests are two-way adjustable. And as I said before, the general design of the front seats is very similar to the Corolla without the cross. This is the XSE trim, so we have the soft Tex upholstery here. You would get cloth in the S and the SE trim. Moving over to the front doors, we have a combination of materials, a soft touch upper section, soft armrest, and then hard plastics between those two sections, and of course down at the bottom of the door, for instance around that bottle holder down there at the bottom to help improve durability. The rear doors have a very similar design to the front doors, but they're made from all hard plastics up top, and they have my least favorite cup holder design for the rear passengers, although at least it does have a cup holder. My issue with this is that if your kids have a Slurpee in there and then they slam the door, obviously that's going to end up on the carpet. On the other hand, we have more cup holders in here than we find in the competition because there's still two in the armrest. These are definitely the ones I would have my kids use. Moving back up to the dashboard, we have a large bin-style glove compartment. There'd be no problem fitting larger tablet computers inside. Moving back up to the upper portion of the dashboard, we have a combination of plastic materials. The upper section of the dash is made from hard plastics and the midsection from a soft touch material. Then lower, we get hard plastics, but that is not consistent across the dashboard. On the far left side of the steering wheel, we have a hard plastic section that I'll show you in a bit that mimics what's going on over here in the soft touch materials. In addition to supporting wireless or wired smartphone integration, this has the new software that we see in the Tundra, the Sequoia, and pretty much every other new Toyota and Lexus model. It features a very flat interface, so we just have those shortcuts over there on the left side of the screen. Very simplistic menu. It's not the most fully featured system, but it is definitely easy to use and much better than what we saw in the previous generation. Below the screen, we find the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control, the engine start stop button, and again, a center console that has a very similar theme to the rest of the Corolla lineup. We have a single USB-C input for the system right there, toggle switches for the heated seats. This model has a wireless charging mat for your smartphone there, pretty traditional console shifter with a sport mode over to the left and then a manual mode there. 
parking brake right there, electronic brake hold, two pretty decently sized cup holders in the middle. You'd have no problem with larger drinks. Center console is a little on the small side. There's an additional charge only port there, but the storage area is a little bit longer than some. So you couldn't put a half gallon of milk in there, but some of those larger items might barely fit. It's then wrapped in some soft touch material matching the upholstery on the seats. On the driver's side, we have a partial LCD instrument cluster. We have LEDs for the fuel level and the engine temperature, and then a seven inch LCD right here in the middle of everything. This is just as configurable as it is in the rest of the Corolla lineup. Of course, you get your hybrid gauges there, trip computer information, readouts from your multimedia system, etc. This steering wheel is the same Corolla three spoke design we find in the other models. You have the controls for the adaptive cruise control over here on this side, along with some of the multimedia buttons. So track forward, backward, and mode over there, volume up, down over here on this side. These controls relate to that multifunction LCD instrument cluster. We then have shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel, which I do think is a little bit odd. I would have preferred that those were regen paddles because shift paddles on a hybrid like this are just about as useful as shift paddles on a French poodle. One thing that I've always found unusual about the Corolla continues on the Corolla Cross. To the left of the steering wheel, this section of the dash is a hard plastic, but we then have soft touch materials on the door and then soft touch materials over here on the center of the dashboard. I do wish that had been a little bit more consistent. As with most of Toyota's hybrids, the Corolla Cross Hybrid is all about fuel economy, and that has been really impressive today. We've been averaging 44 miles per gallon, even though I've been climbing up from approximately sea level up here to about 700 feet. And we've been doing a lot of stop and go driving, a lot of higher speed driving as well. That's a really good fuel economy score. I suspect in the real world, this is gonna be solidly above the regular RAV4 Hybrid. The RAV4 Hybrid is rated for 40 MPG in most trims, and a lot of people had expected this to be around 37 or 38, that's what Toyota had initially said. In reality, this ended up getting a 42 mile per gallon EPA rating, and I suspect it's gonna be beating that in most drive cycles. I'm gonna go ahead and post the final number on your screen when we get back to the hotel so you can have a better idea of what that round trip fuel economy was like. Any way you slice it, very impressive. The interesting secondary mission of the Corolla Cross Hybrid that I hadn't expected is the performance. Zero to 60 should be right around seven seconds. They may not sound like a lot, but for a subcompact crossover like this, that is absolutely excellent and definitely above something like the Subaru Crosstrek. Base version of the Crosstrek is gonna be around eight to eight and a half seconds, somewhere around there, and maybe seven and a half seconds with the up-level engine option. The reason this is so much faster is not just the horsepower number at 196, but also the added torque of the electric motors, which definitely gives this a different feel. In a lot of CVT equipped vehicles, you get the droning when you're accelerating, but then when you let your foot off the accelerator pedal, you actually get this moment of a little bit more acceleration, which is a little disconcerting. Here, we don't get that at all because of the style of this hybrid system. And that hybrid system is of course key to the fuel economy in this vehicle as well. When it comes to the handling and the braking scores, obviously you're gonna have to wait till I get this at home for final details, but it feels basically like the rest of the Corolla Cross lineup. It certainly feels higher off the ground than the regular Corolla, so it's not gonna cut the rug as tightly as something like a Corolla hatchback, obviously not like a GR Corolla, but it's perfectly acceptable for this segment. It feels that body roll and tip and dive are actually a little bit better controlled than we find in the Subaru Crosstrek. Subaru really has tuned that suspension design for a little bit more soft roading durability as well as comfort on those roads, and that just leads to a softer suspension tune. So if you're after something a little bit softer, you wanna look there. If you're after something a little bit firmer, take a look here. This also has a sport tuned variant of the suspension that we find in the regular Corolla Cross, just a hair firmer, it's not a big deal. The big change in terms of suspension tuning was simply due to the added weight of the battery pack in the rear. But oddly enough, the added weight of the battery pack and the motor in the back help balance the weight distribution in this vehicle front to rear a little bit more. So it is gonna feel a little bit better balanced in terms of neutral handling than the regular Corolla Cross, albeit just a little bit heavier. Although the interior of the Corolla Cross isn't the most premium in this segment, the behavior of this suspension out on the road really is. The rear suspension doesn't become upset over broken pavement, and there is some seriously potholed pavement going on on this road further up. There's some potholes that I thought we might lose a small car in that we're going to approach up here, but this handles all of that really well. We were on some rougher roads earlier, potholed roads, expansion joints, speed bumps, etc. This has a really solid feel. And we do have a lot of ground clearance as well, which partially had, adds to that. You can definitely see some of those big potholes there. Eight inches is not class leading, but it's certainly above average for this segment. And you shouldn't have any issues at national parks or things like that. Speaking of national parks and perhaps mild off-roading, 
At this point in time, I can't comment too much on the capability of this all-wheel drive system, but I do have some numbers for you. The electric motor on the back is good for about 40 horsepower, a little over 60 pound-feet of torque. That may not sound like a great deal, but when you think about it, in most low-speed off-roading situations, dirt trails, rocky trails, etc., you're going to be traveling at relatively lower speeds, and the engine is probably not going to be producing much more than 80 horsepower, 120 pound-feet of torque in any of the entries in this segment. And at those speeds, this vehicle could split power 50-50 front and rear. So going up steeper inclines, maybe some undulations in the trail, some mild moguls, etc. This is likely going to be just fine. But if you want to take things to the next level and you really are in a sticky off-road situation, you're going to want to take a look at something like a Bronco Sport with a mechanical connection, a torque vectoring rear axle that acts as a locking rear differential, etc. That's going to give you greater capability than we find in this model. But the trade-off there is really going to be fuel economy. And again, that's the big advantage that the Corolla Cross has against all of the competition. So bottom line, if you're looking for a small, easy to park crossover that gets truly impressive fuel economy, Get the Corolla Cross, whether you drive it gently or you drive it hard, you're probably going to be right around the 42 mile per gallon mark. I've been extremely impressed in this vehicle so far. Again, about 44 miles per gallon, and that's probably going to tick back up as we get closer to the base camp here that Toyota's been using down here in Southern California. I wouldn't be surprised if in our testing cycle at home, this was more like 45, maybe 46 miles per gallon. Remember that this exact same hybrid system in the new Corolla and in the new Prius hybrids get over 50 miles per gallon. So clearly if you're treating this gently, especially in and around town, you should expect absolutely excellent fuel economy. And that's definitely what we've been getting. Now to the nitty gritty. The Corolla Cross hybrid is gonna cost you more than the regular Corolla Cross any way you slice it but the difference is not enormous. This starts at $27,970. If you were to try and compare this to the non-hybrid Corolla Cross, the feature set of the base S trim would be somewhere between L and LE, so somewhere between about $25,000 and $26,000 when equipped with all-wheel drive. So about $2,000 more than a comparable non-hybrid Corolla Cross, but you get significantly better fuel economy. You're probably gonna pay that back in about three years and significantly more power under the hood, which is the interesting twist. I had sort of expected the Corolla Cross to be maybe 150, 160 horsepower, and instead Toyota decided to take this almost to 200. Definitely an interesting twist for this segment. And that means that you're gonna not only get more power, but also better fuel economy than in all of the competition, except for something like the new Hornet. Even the 2.5 liter Subaru Crosstrek, which hopefully I'll be driving soon, is likely gonna go zero to 60 slower than this model, while consuming about 15 miles per gallon on average more. Now, you're probably gonna want the SE trim, I would say, because you're gonna get a slightly nicer interior, a few extra features, etc. That's gonna be 29,290. If you want the soft text upholstery that we saw in this model, the wider tires, the two-tone color scheme, etc., you have to step up to the XSE, which starts at 31. 1065 and if you get carried away with options you're going to be right around $35,000 tops plus of course tax title license and that destination charge. To be honest I'm surprised it has taken us so long to get an over 40 mile per gallon hybrid entry in this segment with all-wheel drive. The Kia Nero is an excellent option I do like it a lot but no all-wheel drive and much lower ground clearance means it's absolutely off the list for a ton of shoppers. If that describes you, then you should absolutely put this on your shopping list. Clearly, the all-wheel drive system is not going to be as capable as what we find in the Subaru Crosstrek. For most folks, however, this is going to be absolutely fine and it's going to save you an awful lot of money in the long run. Also, generally speaking, this should be more reliable not just than the Subaru Crosstrek, also likely more reliable than the regular version of the Corolla Cross as well. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below and stay tuned because hopefully I will have one of these at home for a complete review just as soon as I can where we can really give this e all wheel drive system a solid test. Until then, if you're looking for one, head on down to your Toyota dealer because these should be on dealer showroom floors right around the time that you're watching this video and be prepared to spend right around $30,000. I am surprised that the pricing range of this is pretty narrow, basically $28,000 to $35,000. That's a pretty decent value, and I would seriously consider one of these over a Toyota RAV4 if you're looking for high fuel economy and you don't need the extra storage room in the back. The RAV4's hybrid system will give you a little bit more power than the Corolla Cross's hybrid system, but it's also a slightly bigger and heavier vehicle. And its price tag has increased a little bit over time. This is really attractive at that $28,000 base price. See all of you next week.